so here's a kind of a convoluted example of, of a class C and a class D kind of joined together. And I thought this was kind of funky looking. Daddy, you may be looking at it like, well, this is kind of weird. I actually found something in Rhode Island that looks exactly like this. Um, okay, where, the, sure. where the D like literally cut into the C. Like, because normally you see it, you guys can't see my um, mouse, can you? On the I got you. Yes. Oh, you can see it? Okay. I'm going to drop an icon. I was playing with this earlier because I know sometimes you can't see that thing, but maybe you can see this icon. But um, we're normally these kind of like cut around each other and all this stuff, but it was literally like this where they're butted up uh, into each other. And I thought that was kind of weird. But at any rate, um, as, as you guys, I'm sure, understand the basics, when you've got an airfield, you're going to have some sort of either, either you're going to have a controlled or an uncontrolled, you know, air airfield. Uh, and if it's controlled, it's going to have some sort of tower. And if it's going to have some sort of tower, it's going to have some sort of airspace that um, um, uh, is going to dictate what you have to do inside of that. So here we've got a basic C and a D. And Deddy, I'll just ask you, if you don't mind, to put you on the spot. Just kind of give us a basic explanation of, of the difference between a D and a C. So I'll start with the Delta. So a class Delta airspace is a uh, pretty common, like smaller airport airspace. It's also an airspace that's pretty common for a lot of military airports. Um, but essentially with a Delta, you're going to receive what's referred to as like VFR services, um, unless you're on an IFR flight plan. So essentially the Delta is not, or the Delta controller, whoever's in charge of it is not responsible for separating VFR aircraft. And the only requirements to enter the airspace is um, having two-way radio communications. So you don't need specific clearance to enter the Delta. So all you would need to do is, you know, you know, ask SIT Tower, whatever, 1-1, one, one, 30 miles to the northeast, looking to land, you know, Helipad Charlie or Helipad 1 or Spot 1 or whatever. Um, and all the controller would have to do is, like, call sign Roger or call sign, you know, continue inbound, make approach straight in. Uh, and that constitutes your approval to enter. Um, whereas um, Class Charlie, uh, the IFR aircraft are still going to receive IFR services. Um, all aircraft are still going to be sequenced. So essentially, <clears throat> you are going to still receive like all the normal traffic services that you would normally receive. You're still going to get SA on all the other aircraft. Um, the only difference is all aircraft are going to be separated within a Charlie. So there are mandatory separation requirements. So think about it this way. If you're an IFR air, or if you're on a VFR flight plan and you're flying into a Charlie, you will be treated as though you're IFR. So you will be given vectors and you will be given actual separation from other aircraft. Whereas if you're in a, in a Delta, you're just going to be sequenced. Um, and the only difference between that is aside from... Like instead of just being not touching each other within a Delta, you're going to have actual mileage requirements um, between you and another aircraft within a Charlie. Um, and then you're also going to need permission to enter the Charlie. So you're going to be given a clearance to enter that Charlie airspace. Uh, and or sometimes it'll be a Charlie shelf, kind of what's shown right there, the 22 to 60. Uh, that'll constitute po a portion of the Charlie airspace. And then the other major difference is Charlie's. Uh, similar to Bravo's, um, are significantly larger in most cases than Delta's. Um, so a Delta is just going to be a traditional circle around the uh, uh, around the airport, with some exceptions. I have seen some Deltas that have shelves, whereas a Charlie and a Bravo, um, in this case, a Charlie is going to have a shelf and then a surface to whatever altitude uh, circle around the airspace or around the air, uh, airport. What he's talking about with the core and the shelf, so... You know, we're seeing it from the top down where you've just got this airspace. And, and a D, correct me if I'm wrong, Daddy, but a, a D is typically four miles and a C is typically five and ten. Yeah, so that's usually pretty common. It can vary, obviously, but that's the most common sure. configuration, yeah. So what we're looking at from the side is this column of, of airspace that's sitting over the airfield. And like we just said, the D is, is about four miles, roughly. And it's going to be depicted on the map. And then uh, uh, surface-wise, I think uh, it's 20, 2,500 AGL, yep. if I remember correctly. Correct. Uh, so that's AGL. So again, on our example in Syria, the, 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 the surface is like 2,000 feet. So um, so you've got to add that, right? So it's, it's 2,500 AGL, but... And you'll see it again later, but 4,500 MSL. 
Um, so that, that sometimes gets confusing for people. Um, and then for your class C, same kind of concept, but you've got this shelf. My drawing suck. <laughs> and then you've got this core. Okay. And so once again, we've got this 10 miles, five miles, and then I can't remember the exact uh, elevation, but it, again, it's going to be depicted on the map. I think it's 1200 AGL to four, four, 4,000. Yeah. It's like four, it's 4,000 or 4,500. I can't remember, yeah, but seems, I don't work at, I've only worked one Charlie, so I don't really remember. Yeah. And I don't get too hung up on memorizing that because I don't care because it's on the map. Like, and on, yeah, so everything's going to be published. Yeah, there's only so many penguins I can put on the iceberg. Uh, and then the, the core <laughs> is going to start at the surface. Okay, so you guys can see that you can underneath here, this is uncontrolled airspace. And so if you think about it, the idea is that this is a bigger airport, like Daddy said, so there's probably going to be more IFR traffic. So there's going to be, you know, these kind of airports, like around here, I fly out of Trenton, it's a class D. We have Frontier, which is flies Airbuses, but they come in very seldom. It's kind of a small airport. A class C, we've got like Reading, Pennsylvania, or I'm sorry, Allentown, Pennsylvania, where you've got a lot of regional jets come in. So if you think, kind of think about it, they're coming in on these, these approaches and they're coming in from a high altitude, right? Um, being vectored in from ATC. So you've gone a little bit more control. And then when you get to the big boys, it's really just kind of a, a, a class C plus is the class B. And that's where you get these massive pieces of airspace that, that have probably multiple shelves. Um, yeah. And, it's going to uh, kind of look like an upside down cake, like an upside down wedding cake. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I've kind of screwed this drawing up, but, but class B, you know, could be like New York city, uh, Philadelphia, Atlanta. These are these massive airports where you've got a lot of big jets coming in and, and they again, do it this way because you've got a lot of traffic coming in and this is very controlled and we're not even going to get into this, but this is a lot more controlled. Um, uh, there's a little bit more involved is we've got the, the, for the class Charlie here at Damascus, which I'm sure Damascus would probably be a class like Bravo, but, but we'll, yeah. we'll call it a class Charlie. Um, you've got the core right here and then you've got the shelf. And then what I've done is just kind of depicted what those altitudes would be. Again, this is surface to 6,000. So I've already done that math, um, for MSL. So, uh, and then over here it's 2,200. So the, the base altitude here is I think 2000. So, uh, that shelf that 10 miles out is 22 or I'm, I'm sorry, 2,200 to 6,000. Um, and then here's our Delta, which kind of butts up under it. So it's, if you can kind of visualize this, you've got this class Delta that's underneath this shelf. So if I'm flying here, if I'm flying here, um, at like, you know, a thousand feet, I'm underneath this guy's airspace. I don't need to really talk to him. I mean, I should, but I'm not, I don't need to talk to him, but if I pop into here, now I got to talk to this guy. I pop into here. I got to talk to this guy. If I, if I climb and get between this 22 and 6,000, I got to talk to this guy. Sure. Go it might be worth mentioning that the, that approach path, um, into those that'll, mm. so the one on the outlying shelf, that'll be in the airspace above the surface. So that's, that's what that shelf is there for. Yeah. yeah. So that, that approach path, the altitude that is on glide slope on that approach path is yeah. in the controlled airspace. That's right. right. Yeah, so what he's saying is if you are picking up this ILS localizer, you're going to get into this controlled airspace. And you're, and you're going to get vectored in. I mean, if you're flying IFR, somebody's going to be vectoring you, and you're going to be controlled all the way down. Uh, but the idea is that they don't want, you know, regional jet one, two, three, halfway through this approach. And then here comes, you know, Billy Bob and his Piper with no radio or something just flying in the middle of it, which, which can happen, so... So that's the fundamentals of air traffic control. Very, very, very fundamental, um, just to give you guys some ideas. And then uh, I guess what we can talk about, Duddy, is um, kind of procedures on the airfield. So the question I get a yep. lot of times, and I know I've seen it a lot in the, uh, in the Discord, is helicopters. How do helicopters work at airports and, and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about... If you would, uh, just just a traffic pattern, Daddy. Like, what is the what is a traffic pattern? What's the point of it? All that good stuff. Okay, um, yeah. So, just in general, uh, when most people refer to a traffic pattern, you're going to be referring to what's known as a rectangular pattern. 
Um, so that's essentially going to be if we're looking at zero five left, uh, two five right, or two three right, which is the northern runway. Your uh, you're going to have three elements to it essentially. It's actually technically four, but two of them are the same. So you're going to have um, a downwind, a crosswind, and upwind. Um, so. <laughs> So a um, upwind to start is typically going to, or not typically, it is going to be in line with the direction of the runway that you are landing on. So let's say you're on final, um, I'm just going to use 05 left. Um, so if you're north eastbound, you are going to be upwind is going to be referring to on a 050 heading. So lining up with the 05 on the runway. Um, crosswind, um, in this case, is going to be a left-hand turn um, to essentially perpendicular to the runway. Um, so uh, if you're looking, it's either what is usually referred to as the base um, or the, technically the crosswind for when you're turning out. So a crosswind is going to be a left-hand turn out to the downwind, and then a base turn is essentially a crosswind, but to the, down, or to the uh, upwind or to the runway. Um, and then the downwind leg is going to be the opposite direction of travel for where you want to be landing. So in this case, since we're on 05 left and 23 right, it's going to be a 230 heading roughly since their you know, runway uh, markings are, are rounded. Um, and yeah, and then uh, coming down the downwind, like I said, you're going to turn left onto the base, which is essentially just the opposite of a crosswind. They're basically the same thing, except you just are coming to the runway as opposed to going away from it. Um, standard direction of turns is always going to be left-hand turns unless otherwise specified. Dual downwinds are a thing, um, though, so you can run downwinds on either side, um, and it really just depends on the traffic load. That's more common at like fighter bases than it is at heli like a, any helicopter plate or any heliports or small heliports or uh, helicopter operations that I've worked. I've never ran dual downwinds just because we don't have a ton. I can't imagine, though, in certain training environments that you would run something like that. Um, and yeah, and I guess the only thing that I left out, kind of what Casmo marked, is final, um, which is essentially just going to be the upwind, but prior to getting over the approach end of the runway. Um, so that's usually referred to as short final, um, whereas final is typically going to refer to the radar pattern, which is like essentially a rectangular pattern locally, just scale it up by about 10 times as far as distance goes. Um, but yeah, there's, that's pretty much the basics of like what a normal traffic pattern would look like. Um, as far as altitudes go, um, per hour reg for the FAA, um, helicopters are supposed to conduct um, rectangular operations at or below 500 feet. However, that doesn't always happen. Um, and typically, it'll be locally assigned. Um, but a lot of times, it's going to be 500 feet below whatever the normal traffic pattern is traffic pattern is which is typically 1500 feet agl yeah so and it kind of depends on what it is right so for fixed yeah. wing general aviation like flying cessnas around here it's a thousand feet agl for the bigger jets for faster jet i think it's 1500 for helicopters mm -hmm. it could be five to seven hundred feet you know and again it's kind of one of these things where the airfield will tell you like um there could be different procedures at that airfield and, and generally like on four flight or something it will tell you what what those are uh, for the traffic patterns. So yeah, so upwind, crosswind, downwind, base, final. So the basics here is that if we are flying, what is this runway? Zero five left. So yeah, so if we're flying zero five, um, we're going to do left traffic, meaning we're taking left turns. So this is the upwind. Uh, we're going to turn to cross. We're going to turn to downwind, turn to base, turn to final. If you were doing right traffic, then you're going to make right turns. Um, for helicopters, we can do this. But I will tell you, at a big airport, you generally do not do this. You're generally going to come straight in. So, Daddy, talk a little bit about that. Why? Why would you want to do that? Yeah. So the biggest uh, the biggest factor to having an amended traffic pattern for a helicopter, whether that be uh, making the approach straight in, whether that making whether that be making an amended rectangular pattern where you're offset from everyone else inside, closer to the runway, um, is the biggest factor is speed. Um, while he helicopters are significantly better at maneuvering and the amazing attribute of a helicopter being able to stay still. Um, you, helicopters are typically much slower than, especially in military environments, than the aircraft that are operating. In general aviation environments, it's a little bit easier to maintain uh, a normal pattern, but that's typically why you're going to be altitude separated or you're going to be making the approach straight in. So 
Uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. So let's say they're going to land on that ramp that's directly in between uh, the runways right there, that southern ramp. Yep. Um, they're a, typically what the controller will want you to do is get the most efficient way and the fastest way across final. Um, so that way they can continue running aircraft into that runway. So what you're going to end up doing is usually making a very steep or shallow, or sorry, steep approach into final right near the approach end. So almost as if you're making a line, yeah, perfect, um, into right the area right around the approach end. Um, and then you will essentially cross the runway, cross the controlled movement area directly to the approach or directly to the uh, landing area. Um, and there are certain procedures for that. That's a little bit getting into the weeds, but essentially if it's not a, if it's just a regular movement area and not an approved landing area, um, uh, which is kind of sounds counterintuitive because helicopters based on local procedures are able to land at non-approved landing areas. You'll get, instead of a landing clearance, like you would normally hear, you know, clear to land, you'll get a landing at your own risk. Um, just for a CYA cover your ass, uh, aspect on the. FAA slash controllers part, depending on whatever your civil aviation authority is. Um, but yeah, then there's a couple of different uh, different amendments to that. Uh, you can make approach straight in, which is what I was just referring to. So make approach straight in, let's say north ramp. You can make uh, direct approach midfield downwind. So kind of what Casmo just outlined, where you just make the you make a direct line across midfield downwind. Make approach direct base. Um, so they'll essentially just line up directly to the base turn and then break off. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do it. Uh, but that's kind of like the basics of headed straight to a landing area as opposed to a runway. Um, and the same thing will kind of apply to a heliport environment. So make approach straight in direct, you know, helipad number one, or however your helipads are are broken up. Um, at Holloman, which is the base that I'm out of, uh, we'll typically, we have a ramp called the North Ramp. Um, so we'll say make approach straight in North Ramp. Um, or we have specific arrivals um, that we have set out. So they'll, they'll have different localized names and stuff like that. Kind of like any, any star um, that you would have standard, uh, standard terminal approach to like a big airport. So, you know, uh, cross whatever point, at whatever altitude uh, cleared, you know, Damascus Yankee approach, uh, you know, whatever it is. So let's... Um... We'll kind of put this into a context thing. Let's say that the helicopters, because this is kind of a big terminal area. This is probably where all your, your big jets are going to be. But here's probably where your helicopters are going to operate. So what I typically hear at Trenton, um, because there's a lot of big helicopters that come in here as well, um, is they're just going to, like Daddy said, they're going to clear you probably directly in or very close to. So that a lot of times, you know, I've never once here at Trenton heard a helicopter cleared to land on the runway. Never once. It's always a taxiway. Yeah. So these aren't labeled, but we'll just say this is taxiway alpha and this is taxiway Bravo. Um, so, you know, if you're coming in, what you'll hear a lot of times is something like, uh, you know, cleared for, uh, arrival, uh, land, a uh, taxiway alpha remain North of zero five, right. Land at your own risk, you know, uh, landing areas not observed by the tower stuff like that. So basically the tower is saying, I can't see where I'm telling you to land. So I don't know if there's a truck park there. So be careful. Um, but you're clear to land remain north of the zero five. And so what he's, he's saying is stay out of my way. All right. is a nice way of saying, because over here we're going to have right traffic and he's saying, just stay north of that. And it would not be uncommon to be an airplane, to be flying this traffic pattern and see that helicopter coming in and even landing alongside of him. All right. I've done that many times on the airplane yeah. and helicopter side. Um, but that's how they, they kind of keep that, uh, separated. And then same thing, if you're coming from this direction, you know, they could clear you straight across when they've got a gap. But if they do have a lot of downwind traffic, you know, they may have you come in this way or come around that way. But the point that Daddy's getting at is generally speaking, at a large airport, you don't see a whole lot of traffic pattern with helicopters. Um, we do have a question from the chat. Distance between up and downwind, how tight and late should you turn? Um, so, go ahead. Yeah, what do oh, you go ahead. No, oh, go ahead. You, can, you can answer it. Yeah. Well, I'll just say from the pilot side, um, you know, on the fixed wing side, doing these doing these things, uh, let's say that the traffic pattern altitude here, we'll use Trenton as an example, 1,200 feet is the traffic pattern altitude. So 300 feet prior to that is when we can turn. Well, it's a little bit different here because there's some noise abatement procedures in effect. But uh, typically, you would start your climb out, and then once you hit uh, 300 feet prior to that, you would start turning crosswind. You'd continue climbing up to the traffic pattern altitude at 12, and then you turn 
maintain that 12 right about a beam with the uh, runway is when you really start slowing down you know you pull the power out quite a bit drop your flaps to 10 um, let's start a little bit of a descent continue to descend here you're probably gonna be about 700 or so feet and you're gonna continue to turn around drop flaps you know drop flaps again on the base drop your final flaps on final uh, if you're landing sure and then touch down uh, for helicopter traffic patterns, you're basically going to adjust based on, again, that traffic pattern altitude uh, if you were doing those. So there's not really a yeah. distance so much as there is an altitude and then just a comfort of how long the, the question here, because you can get upwind, crosswind, you could turn downwind pretty quick, but now you're really close to the runway and that may screw you over here where you're trying to bleed off some speed and you're trying to not over, especially at an airport where you've got runways next to each other you don't want to go too far because now you're getting into this other guy's territory. So you want to make sure your downwind's far enough out that you can make those turns. So a lot of times, you know, I'll turn cross and I just, I'll hit the altitude and I'll just keep flying until I get a good distance because I'm going to set myself up for that good uh, base to final. Yeah. And it's actually interesting um, that you, that the way that you said that, because um, it kind of, it kind of shows just how fluid uh, traffic patterns and, or how much they vary rather. Yeah. Uh, cause typically a, a downwind is going to be one mile, uh, per, mm -hmm. from the ATC side. That's all we expect. Right. Um, however, like just you talking about it, if, if, you know, hot for at Holloman, we have an inside and an outside downwind. Mm -hmm. So you, you have a one mile and a three mile downwind. Um, and that's mm -hmm. a lot of that reason is for sequencing because of the, the type of aircraft that we have, but that's actually pretty common at a lot of, at a lot of, uh, airports that run tack traffic is you're going to have sometimes an um, inside a middle and an outside downwind mm -hmm. um so it just really it goes to show that you know being in the pubs is really really important um as far as knowing what airport you're coming into or or understanding the environment you're flying in because everything's going to be different you know yeah. case to case or you may get a completely different set of instructions when you come in you know on tuesday than you would get on friday yeah and 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 what we're talking to very different things, right? So Daddy's talking about a lot of jet traffic and, and high performance aircraft. You know, I'm talking little piddle putted Cessnas and, and stuff that, you know, there's, there's not as much expectation of distance and, and speed and everything. Yeah. Um, but he's absolutely right. And you, and you, I mean, every airport I go to, if I haven't been there uh, several times, you know, I'm pulling up the pub to just at, at, at a minimum understand, okay, what is the traffic pattern altitude? And are there any restrictions, like I said, with noise abatement? Because at Trenton, we have to continue to climb up to 1,200 before we can turn. Well, that's the traffic pattern altitude. Um, and so you're going to be a little bit further out on your upwind and all that jazz. But it doesn't really specify a distance in the pubs, you know, from uh, from the airport procedure. But the ATC, exactly. There's things that ATC expects of you, right? So ATC expects if you're descending, it's, what, a 500 foot per minute rate of descent at least. Correct. Uh, yeah. and, and same for a climb and things like that. So there's little expectations that ATC has. So when they tell you something, they're just, they're taking it for granted that you're going at whatever. Um, and if you can't, then you have to tell them that. So, um, exactly. you could but, also yeah, go ahead. throw in, um, if you're a helicopter and you are in a traffic pattern, you need to kind of think of yourself as a fixed wing and you need to behave mm -hmm. predictably so that other folks in the pattern or coming into the pattern right. know where to look for you. you you don't want to be um that guy that's kind of ofo doing his own thing because everything in aviation relies on procedures so if you call mm -hmm. uh helicopter one two three four five in the left downwind landing zero five uh everybody else that's near there will know where to look provided you're doing what you're is generally accepted as good practice yeah. so if you're at a more busy airport and you're given, you know, clear, uh, landing instructions are clear to land direct to the ramp at, at, you know, whatever FBO, you do that as directly as possible. Otherwise, let's say you're at an uncontrolled, you know, little piddle uh, airport, an uncontrolled airport, you should fly a predictable traffic pattern and not do anything unpredictable because those guys that are in the Cessnas pulling out of their little hangar and and entering the quote unquote active, um, we'll know where to look for you when you're calling left base landing three one. Yeah. So, and that brings up a good example. So let's, let's, well, I don't even have a number. Uh, let's say <laughs> that this is an uncontrolled airport. It has no, uh, tower. It's all based off of common frequencies, which here's the thing. And I hate this, you know, you can fly in the national airspace without a radio in, in most places. Um, you can fly into an airport that doesn't have a tower and not even have a radio. Um, 
And so just like Brenda said, predictability at that point is, is huge. And, and honestly, why I avoid untowered airports, because I've just had too many close calls. Um, but you want to have a predictable pattern. So if we know that the, the traffic pattern is, is landing uh, from west to east on whatever this runway is, you know, we know that this is the upwind, the cross, the downwind. You're supposed to enter that downwind at a 45 degree angle because if you don't have a radio, you can't announce that you're doing it. But Joe Bob is taken off in his Cherokee and he's flying around. He knows to at least look for that and expect that if someone's coming in, they should be coming like that. Um, the, the challenge is, of course, everyone who's flown for a while has been to that airport where somebody just kind of just does their own thing and, and starts, you know, kind of entering the traffic pattern in a weird way or something. Um, so you do want to be predictable, but at the same time, you know, I'm not against, you know, if, if I'm coming in this way, I'm not going all the way around in our 45, I'm going to come straight <laughs> and land, land, land on an extended final, but I can see what's going on. I can see if there's anyone in the pattern. So, um, anyway, yeah. And if, uh, if you are doing something that is outside of the norm, you, you just let everybody know, Hey, this is Cessna yeah. one, two, three, four, five, extended 10 mile final running landing runway zero six yeah and everybody knows what that means and they know where to look for you yeah, yeah there's very few things that are wrong as long as you're you're talking yeah and and just keeping your head on a swivel because there is that dude that just does not have a radio um and just be advised of him and somebody made a joke and there's always somebody that that 15 mile final of four people in the pattern yeah um so and that's the other thing too and we're kind of going into a whole tangent but if you are going into an untired airfield you should be listening early on trying to get a lay of the land if nothing else to figure out which way everyone's landing you know because if winds are calm or if winds are a direct crosswind well which which runway are they using i don't know you know and and it may make sense for you to land this way but everyone's landing this way and so you just kind of have to listen in and get some understanding um you can call and ask for advisories though everyone thinks you're a poop head if you do that so um but anyway back to the airspace here so we've talked about uh, basic traffic patterns and we've got this runway, this this huge airport, and then we've got these smaller places, right? So these would be typically like heliports. And these are kind of weird looking. I guess maybe in Syria they do it this way. I mean, we have army heliports that look not like this, but basically a concept. I mean, if you look at uh, Brenda's where we were at, at Simmons, I mean, you had a runway, but there weren't many fixed wing that came in on it unless they were like those, those fancy uh, stole aircraft. Um, that could take off in like 10 feet. Um, and then like places like Fort hood, you know, you, again, you have runways, but they're not fixed wing runways. They're just kind of these little, little runways. And so you are going to use them. And then, so it's kind of funny at a heliport. I'm more used to flying a traffic pattern at a heliport than I am at a actual airport with a runway. Um, daddy, have you worked any of these type before? Yeah. So the, we, uh, typically the airports refers to them as tack runways. Um, okay. we, we do because we typically don't work heliports. Uh, a lot sure. of that's mostly army controllers, and a lot of our JTACs will do it or CCTs. Um, but uh, my last deployment, I actually we had a TAC runway that was used for training and used for a contingency. And it was used by like 130s and uh, UH60s, H64s, and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, we we did have a couple of a uh, couple of places that we that we did that, and then we would do TAC runway operations to a taxiway as well. Uh, so we essentially broke up a portion of the airfield that had parking spots similar to to pads um, that had a taxiway in between that we used as a tack runway. Okay. Yeah, Casmo, think of the the base fields around Fort Rucker, right? Um, right. Knox, Hanchi, Low, Shell. Mm -hmm. are, are, there are no runways, but there are literally hundreds of helicopters operating out in there yeah. every day. So absolutely use traffic patterns, even mm -hmm. though there is not even a runway. Yeah. Yeah, if you come into Hanchi, it's it's just a huge parking lot that you basically w w trying to picture it. It's basically like a parking lot with little pads sticking out of it, and so you fly a traffic pattern and you land to that pad, which that pad basically leads straight to a taxiway between all the parking spots. Um, and so it is, it is kind of funky. I wish there was something that could kind of demonstrate that, but. Um, so yeah, but for a heliport, you probably are going to do a little bit more traffic pattern work just because the density of aircraft or um, if there's not a lot going on, then yeah, you may go straight into to a pad or, or you know, probably in this situation, you are going to land at a taxiway or, or you know, this runway is probably going to be used if it's multiple aircraft coming in. So if you've got a flight of four, they're probably all going to come to here and then disperse, 
you know, taxi to their various parking spots. Cause chances are they're not all parked next to each other. So this guy's parked over here and this guy was parked over here and you know, the yada, yada, yada. Um, so kind of the same concept though, depending on where you're coming in, let's say that we did have a flight of four and they were going to land on this runway, this whatever, it doesn't have a number. Um, call it two, five runway two, five. So the flight's coming in this way. They're probably going to be told, okay, enter a right downwind for runway two, five. So they're going to come in. They're going to enter the right downwind. They're going to turn base. They're going to clear to land runway two, five, and they're all going to land. And then they're going to get taxi instructions. Um, and then as daddy pointed out, you know, Delta is a little bit less restrictive. You, you do need to be talking to someone prior to entering the Delta and they're going to, they're going to sequence you in. And then if you've got an airport, yeah. uncontrolled, you're just going to kind of work it yourself. So, um, cool. So let's talk about the procedures of talking, um, of, of what we're supposed to do. So let's, let's go here to this airport. Um, and say that we are going to take off. We are a single aircraft. Uh, we'll call this taxiway alpha and taxiway Bravo. And this was runway zero five, right? So daddy, what are your expectations of me? I I've started engines. I've listened to the METAR. I've got information, Charlie, what, what's next? So first of all, um, because you are an army helicopter, I will expect you to not talk to me, um, take off, <laughs> never talk to me, and then um, leave my airspace. But um, only, only if I'm special ops, they don't like to talk to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so basically what will happen, um, You so they'll call up typically for engine start. Helicopters almost always call for engine start, at least uh, in my experience, um, working at Air Force fields because of the FOD condition, especially with our F-16s that just love to suck up rocks. So they'll, they'll call up for engine start to make sure they're not going to blow shit into the F-16s. Um, but once they are engine start, essentially what I'm looking for is I'm looking for that you have the numbers. So when you call up the Army Copter, you know, 251 Tango Mike has, you know, information alpha ready to taxi, looking for uh, departure, you know, straight out to the east or looking for a specific departure procedure. Um, and for me, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, Roger, are you looking for an in-place takeoff or are you looking to taxi to five? Uh, or zero five right, um, and that's obviously going to depend on the pilot, whatever they're looking for. Uh, I'm assuming a lot of it matters if you guys have a student on board, whether you're looking to see if they can do in place takeoffs or you know whatever it is. Right. Um, but in a in attack environment, a lot of it's going to be in place takeoffs. But if we're going to do a taxi, um, it's essentially just going to be runway zero five right, taxi via Alpha Bravo, advise when you're approaching the runway. Um, so that gives hey, me hey, an Daddy, indication. Quick question. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, have you ever or does ATC ever deny engine start? <laughs> um, I've only done it once and it was because I had the big Antonov, uh, getting ready to taxi and I didn't want the UH 60 to get blown over. Hmm. Okay. But yeah, so almost, I'm just wondering yeah. like on procedurally on an air force base or, or for the helicopters that have APUs, you know, even on an army base, they'll call for mm -hmm. engine start. And mm -hmm. I don't know of any one that's ever been told. No, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, no. I guess you're just announcing you're doing it. Did we do it at Simmons? Did we call engine start? Not the 58s because, you yeah. know, we we don't have radios well, I, and we don't have an APU. Well, but no, I, I think like the, we the did 60s, after we started, though. I, at yeah, least when we, I, we crank and then tell them we crank. Right. Yeah, we're, <laughs> hey, I'm engine start, West Ramp. Yeah. Um, yeah, and a lot of it's used as kind of as an advisory. Um, yeah. So for us, that starts our internal timer. Uh, like, hey, I'm engine start. Okay, cool. This guy's going to be ready to taxi here in about 10, 15 minutes. What's my sequence look like? How many aircraft am I going to have him come out of there? Oh, shit. He just said he's a flight of six. <laughs> like, I'm going to I'm gonna have to build a, a departure core or a departure uh, space for him. Stuff like that. But um, sure. the ta honestly, once you're in contact with ATC, it's pretty easy, self-explanatory. Because the controller is going to ensure you're going to fly the aircraft. The controller is going to ensure you don't get flacked. So... As far as like the awareness of the pilot from our perspective, we're expecting you guys to have your eyes closed for the most part, getting ready to take off. Because unless we're specifically telling you to look for somebody on departure or, hey, you know, Army Copter, whoever, you're going to be following this flight of two F-16s as soon as they're ready to go. Because right behind them, I got a flight of two A-10s coming in. So you better get get up here and get ready. Um, but as far as that goes, it, it's going to be pretty easy. I, did that answer the question? Because I'm I, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, let's talk about the elements of what you said. So, uh, sure. you know, if this were me, oh my God, I can't, 
I keep losing my icon. You know, if I'm here exactly, so I've I've called up. If I if I've got to do the the engine start thing, I will. I I've not mm -hmm. seen that in the civilian side. Of, um, but uh, yeah. But yeah, certainly in the military side, we do it. So, uh, you're gonna call ground. You know, ground army copter one two three four five south ramp VFR departure to the west. I've just let him and with Charlie. You know, mm -hmm. um, and if I didn't say with Charlie, he's gonna read back. Basically, all the pertinent yep. METAR data, winds or blah, 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 altimeter, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so I'm saving him some time by letting him know that I already have that information. Um, so I've told him, hey, I'm a helicopter. And I've told him I'm one helicopter because I didn't say is, you know, in flight is a flight of two or, you know, whatever. So single helicopter on the south ramp. I'm ready for a VFR departure to the west. So I've told him all this stuff. So he's probably going to tell me, you know, if present position departures are something from this ramp, which looking at it, I wouldn't say that they are. Um, no. But he's probably going to say taxi to runway or uh, taxi, taxiway alpha uh, call ready or, you know, or something, you know, whatever he's going to say. So we taxi yeah. out to alpha and we're, we're ready to go. And then I'm going to call tower and say tower army copter one, two, three, four, five taxiway alpha ready for departure. And now he's, he knows, he, you know, he's already gotten the hand over hell half the time. He's the same dude, you know, on yeah. two different radios, <laughs> depending on the airfield, uh, Trenton, it's always, almost always the same person. Uh, but you've re you've called again and basically made recon, you know, contact with tower. They should already know that you want to go departure to the West, generally speaking, because that's what you told ground and ground. So ground knows that, okay, they're departure to the West and they've passed that information. So uh, typically you're just telling the tower, hey, I'm ready to go. And he already knows where you're going to go. Now, sometimes you still need to tell him again because they forgot or it's been busy or something like that. But or they weren't right, listening. Alpha ready to, or they weren't listening or they're just kind of a dick like the one here at Trenton. Um, <laughs> and then he's going to give you approval and poosh, you're gone. Um, and he yeah. probably is going to give instructions in this situation. You say, uh, uh, you know, he's going to tell him ready and daddy, I'll screw this up. and Army copter one two three four five winds calm taxiway alpha departure to the west approve remain north of runway zero five right. And yep. So he's told me I can depart west. I just my restriction is I've got to stay north of this center line uh, so that I don't interfere with any of his incoming traffic. Yep, exactly. And if so, typically those departure amendments will happen as you're taxiing um, a lot of the time. So what ground will do is they'll re they'll look over they'll look at local who's Local is the internal name for tower. And they'll say, hey, local, I got this, you know, H64 coming out. He's looking for a westbound departure. You got anything? Hey, man, actually, yeah, I've got some guys coming into the right downwind um, for zero 05 or for uh, 23 left. So do you mind having him? Can you ask him if he can maintain at or below 500 feet um, until clear of the downwind or until I have that traffic in sight? Yeah, hold on. Let me ask him. Hey, Army Copter 12345, we got a couple of guys coming in just uh verify can you maintain at or below 500 feet or is that going to impact your mission um right and obviously the pilot will respond as required actually no you know my my student needs to you know fucking do whatever make an immediate climb or something for training yeah. uh well we'd rather just stay on the ground until until they're clear okay cool um but that that communication like, like i said everything's gonna be pretty fluid um, depending on what's going on. And it's that's that's one of the big things that I've noticed. And especially I've noticed a lot of DCS pilots are afraid to do is get on the radio and talk. But realistically, you know, when it's just like in actual aviation, no one's going to care if you if you mess up on the radio. It's not that big of a deal. They just would prefer you're talking on the radio and messing up than being seen but not heard because it's always it's always scary to see someone moving around and not talk to them. So, well, point of order: If you're New York air traffic control, you do care if somebody screws up because <laughs> they will. Get yeah, on. I guess that's true. Yeah, <laughs> Last, a couple of days ago, some dude called in for flight following, and he's and the guy's like, "Where are you going?" And he says, uh, "Kilo Alpha Charlie Yankee, or you know, wherever he's going." And the guy's like, okay. "You don't need to add the kilo." And it's like, okay, okay, you know, like, like you don't right, really man. save any time there, but, um, but you know, the, to your point, talking. Um, generally speaking, yes, you're, you're going to screw it up, especially it's so funny to listen to a lot of the young kids because they're coming through and they're learning stuff and they're kind of tripping over their words and stuff. And usually ATC is pretty cool, but it's just a conversation. And, uh, and this, you know, the traffic pattern, that's what I try to get some of these younger pilots here who, who are CFIs to understand is like, this is the baseline 
you know, this is this is the standard, the traffic pattern, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the way it's always going to be. If you're approaching the airfield from the south and we're landing south to north, I've had controllers do it anyway and tell me to enter a right downwind. Well, that's kind of stupid. That's kind of a waste of time. Um, now, if they've got a lot of traffic flowing, then maybe I can see why they need to do it. But you can also enter from the base. Right, they can say oh, enter, you know, enter right base, call three miles, uh, and then I'm just going to set up to basically enter the traffic pattern at 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 a base, and I'm going to let him know when I'm three miles away, and he may sequence me in with the other traffic that's going on. If you're coming from this direction, I mean, there's nothing telling you can't just come in straight in final, and they'll tell you, you know, make for a straight in, call five miles final, runway zero five right, and so that's what yep. you do is you just kind of adjust, and then you let him know when you're five miles out, and then he's gonna either gonna tell you come straight in. If he's got another aircraft on a downwind, what he may do is is uh, say, hey, do you see the guy on final? Yes, I do. Okay, extend your downwind. You're number two, clear to land, runway zero five. So I'm coming straight in. I land. This guy's on the downwind. He saw me, and he's just gonna make his traffic pattern behind me. Okay. Um, I think a big thing, and I'm sure you would agree with me, Daddy, is if you if you pay attention to the radio and you can tell when ATC is going to start asking you questions. If I'm on the downwind and this dude calls five mile final, I'm already looking for this dude because I know tower is going to ask me. And yeah. I'm even, as soon as I see it, if tower hasn't said anything to me, if I see that guy, I'm going to be like, Hey tower army one, two, three, four, five has traffic in sight. has, you know, traffic on final in sight. I'm yep. just helping this guy because otherwise what he's going to do is call me. Hey, Army Carpenter, do we have air, you know, Cessna on five mile final runway zero five call traffic in sight. He's already going to yep. ask me. I'm saving him time by doing that. And I already know, again, he's probably not going to slip me in between. And he might, you know, just kind of depends on the speed. He might slip me in or he might tell me to extend my downwind past that guy and then turn final and be number two. And you'll see it a exactly. lot, especially on a runway where, you know, here at Trenton, they'll run both traffic patterns. So you'll have aircraft, you'll have aircraft that come in and they're heading this on a, a left downwind. You're on a right downwind and it's the same thing. And you know that he's going to call. And so I just tell him, Hey, I've got the opposing downwind traffic in sight. And he says, okay, you'll be number two. So extend your downwind. So this guy's going to come down. He's going to turn base. I'm going to keep him in sight. Then I'm going to turn at a good, a good point where I can then follow him in. Is it on the plate to say like, when do I check in with ATC? Oh, okay. Uh, Daddy, what's what's your answer? If I'm coming into this so, class Delta, okay. let's say I'm coming into the Delta, when should I call? So you just need to establish two-way communications. So I'm going to give you the, the reg answer. You just need to right. establish two-way communications prior to entering. That's the only requirement. However, my preference is it's going to... So this is a lot of aviation is best judgment. So let's say you're coming in and you are not... You know you are not going to be a factor with any of the landing corridors. Um, so you're not close to final in any way. You're coming in kind of perpendicular or you're kind of coming in like crosswind to the runway. Then, you know, if you call out 15, 10, 15 miles out, that's good for me. Five miles out even if I don't have any traffic. Um, but if you're coming in and you know that you're going to be crossing a final, um, let's say to a busier airport, you know, if you're calling out 20 miles, that's I'm never going to be upset. Um, but pretty much uh, whenever you are... It, I would say 20 miles is probably a pretty good marker. 10, 10 to 20 miles, that like area um, is probably a pretty good marker to uh, to go ahead and call a tower to come in. And it's completely different when you're working with a radar approach control because you can call them in, you know, whenever, whenever you're are ready you, to. Are you talking at fast mover speeds or at helicopter speeds? Because it that's you know, it, that's going to be called fast at 20 speed. miles and ATC, you know, yeah. comes yeah. back and tells me, yeah, Roger, Army, Hilo, uh, call me in. Five miles. Yeah. yeah, and and yeah, you're right. That's that's me. That's me. The majority of my career working guys who are going 350, 400 knots. Um, yeah. So yeah, helicopters. If you're calling out ten miles out, then that's going to be 100 percent sufficient, especially for a uh, for a tower controller. Um, even if you're calling up at five, that's also going to be pretty much okay for them. Um, but the biggest thing is just being aware of where you are in relation to the airfield, not just distance wise, but laterally. Um, like, where am I in relation to the landing corridor? Where am I in relation to the departure corridor? Um, because that's really what's going to determine when I need to call these guys. Because all of a sudden, if I see, you know, a bunch of helicopters taking off in their opposite direction, I may be like, oh, maybe I'm not on the, you know, you know, maybe yeah. they're landing the other way now. And then the ATIS is wrong, you know. Yeah. So, uh, 
yeah, but I know that's not really an answer to the question, but that's the best answer to the question. I'll, I'll, <laughs> uh, I'll tackle that. Hold on, let's we'll continue to ex- examine that one. But but I'll also point out something that Deddy brought up is understand the airport and the flow. So the other day I took off out of Trenton and I was heading. Well, let's say I was heading this this direction, but they cleared me for a right turnout. So I you know I turn out. And I'm departure and I'm heading to where I'm going. And I'm kind of realizing as I get to about here that my departure is taking me along the center line. Now, legally, there was nothing wrong with me doing that because they cleared me on course. But it doesn't make sense because somebody's probably going to end up coming in and trying to land that way. And so I, I adjusted my course on my own till I got several miles out and then I adjusted. So so to his point of understand what's happening, the same is is should be said for when you're coming into an airport. Um start listening early to get an idea of the flow and understand that there are aircraft. So I know that this is the, the inbound. So I want to kind of stay away from that center line as best I can. But the, the rule of thumb really for, for towers is a, for slow aircraft, say helicopters, Cessnas, things like that. You know, you're running hundred knots or so 150 knots is, uh, is 10 miles. Um, and I think most towers, at least on the, on the GA side, they don't even have their radar set for more than like 12 miles. So if you call Trenton Tower, and I've seen it happen, you call Trenton Tower at 15 miles, and I've seen dudes do this, and they're like, okay, I don't have you on my scope, call me back at 10. You know, so you're just wasting time. Uh, so, but at probably about 15 miles, I'm really listening to Tower, and then when I get to 10 miles is when I call and give that heads up that I'm that I'm inbound. Um, even though, just like Daddy said when we're talking Delta, uh, I don't have to call until I, well, I, I can't enter this four miles without having some sort of communication. Um, so yes, you could call it five miles, but at that point you're kind of like, you're kind of like an uninvited guest. You know, if he's busy, he's like, Oh shit. You know, I got somebody, you know, that's not very far. So yeah, if you want to call it about the 10 mile mark and start making that communication. And just like that, he said, now they can start factoring you into their whole, their whole plan and their whole, the whole, uh, understanding of what's going on. What, what helps you build that mental picture is have ATIS tuned up and listened to before yeah. you call. Right. Um, and that way, because they're going to tell you the landing direction, what the winds are, what the altimeter is, and all that kind of stuff. So your first initial contact to tower, you can let them know, hey, I have the numbers. And then also yeah. you have a mental picture of how they're going to be setting up traffic flow. Yeah, so that's a good point. So let's just let's go backwards. I'm flying in to this airport. We'll just say this is the 10 mile ring and this is the five mile ring. When I get out here, I'm tuning up ATIS. So I'm probably about 20 miles out. I'm going to start listening to ATIS. I'm going to get the winds, the meet, the, the uh, altimeter. There's mowing activity south of the runway you know, all the bullshit that they put in the METAR. And I'm going to get that letter. And then I'm listening to, then I'm listening to tower, listening to tower, the trend tower, Cessna one, two, three, four, five, ten 10 miles to the Northwest or Northeast inbound for landing and termination. So I'm letting him know what I want to do. That's the other part of it. What do you want to do? Because some airports, you may want to come in and do a touch and go, or you may want to, uh, um, you know, I don't know. You may want to just do a, 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 what do you call it? Low approach or something like that. So letting him know what you're planning to do. So I'm planning to land termination. Um, that means I'm stopping or I'm full stop taxi back departure to the North. So he understands, okay, he wants to land. He wants to then taxi back get back on the runway and then departure and then go to the north. But you're going to let him know all this stuff at that 10 mile mark. He's going to tell you to make straight in for runway two, three. Okay. Well, that's, I'm going to start just kind of drifting that way, you know, make straight in for runway two, three, call five miles. I get to five miles. Uh, Cessna one, two, three is uh five miles straight in Roger clear to land runway two, three. And then I land and then he's going to give me taxi instructions. So, this is a lot. I know we're covering a lot of things. We're probably getting deeper than some of you expected. Uh, any other questions? Awesome. Everyone's got it. Uh, do you guys want to do it? I want to do it. 